Good afternoon. Good afternoon. We're, I think, already a minute or two over time, so we're going to get started here. The visiting is always good. A sign of a good conference is when people are visiting and having a good time between the sessions. Um, so we will um, we'll get going here with the afternoon sessions of the Canola Discovery Forum. Uh, I want to make another mention and a thank you to the, part, uh, the sponsors who made that possible. My name is Ian Epp. I'm an agronomy specialist with the Canola Council of Canada. I cover North Central Saskatchewan and do market access and pesticide work for the crop production team. And I'll be the chair of the next session. Our first speaker is uh, Keith Gabbert from the Canola Council. You saw him chair the last session. We decided we needed somebody with some energy to really get you awake after uh, lunch so you don't fall asleep in your chair. So Keith is the loudest agronomy specialist we have. Uh, so he's going to talk about a, a recent paper that was published from a few authors from the Canola Council talking about emerging threats in canola. Perfect. Thanks, Ian. I wasn't sure where you were going with that introduction, to be honest. Um, for a second there, I thought you were going to say it was the most energetic, and I was, could probably argue that, but loudest, I probably can't argue uh, that point uh, in any way, shape, or form. So thanks for the opportunity to address the group twice. We, uh, we as Canola Council agronomists, have a, a unique opportunity to talk to growers and really get to know what's going on in individual fields, and not only that, to assist and, and help those growers with any agronomic concerns that they have, but also to assist the entire industry to, to get past and to work through and understand any of the issues that might happen uh, with our crop in any given year. And that led to this, uh, this paper, Current and Potential Pest Threats for Canola in the Canadian Prairies. Ian Epp, uh, on the stage with me uh, just previously, is a Canola Council agronomist. There's several others here, but I wanted to call your attention to a map that there's probably a Canola Council agronomist in a field near you, or there should be at some point in the season, and wanted to remind you to take, uh, take every opportunity to, to call something to their attention. That's how we learn to get together as a field visit in the field and, and uh, walk through some of the things that, that you might not have, uh, might not know about canola or that you might learn differently from a Canola Council agronomist. We're all very approachable. I may be the loudest. Uh, we, we all have a really good basic skill set uh, in terms of canola agronomy, but we do also have some specializations that I won't go through. So mine, uh, called upon for this particular conference based upon the insect um, the insect uh, specialization or the insect focus for today uh, isn't necessarily in getting uh, speakers together, but it, it is in specialized in talking about insects and worrying about insects. So I'll try not to focus on insects in the 10 minutes that I've got here, but it's, it sort of goes by default. I'm just not as excited about weeds. Sorry, Ian and Sean. I'm not as excited about diseases. Everybody else on my Canola Council team, uh, but they're all important. Now, we don't usually start Canola Council agronomists quite this young. This is a picture of one of my daughters. I won't tell you which one because it always bothers her if I put presentation material together with family pictures. Um, but this is from a number of years ago, and, and my daughter came back from this field in Olds with probably as many cabbage seed pod weevils on her yellow shorts as she did in the wimpy insect net that isn't really up to code for all the entomologists in the crowd. But it did catch a few cabbage seed pod weevils, and that is sort of the northern range of, of that particular insect. And you'll hear today about a, a number of pests that could be a problem in canola or are a problem in canola or more specifically that we're investigating if they could become a problem in canola. On the top right, yeah, I think I got that right, standing backwards. On the top right is a picture of canola flower midge. We may have got that name wrong, but Boyd Morey in one of the later sessions this afternoon will clarify why that is. Mike Harding, I missed yesterday, but Mike, I'm sure, told you about blackleg hotspots, or at least led you to believe that blackleg was as big a concern as, as anything that might be on my pests and diseases list. And we always get questions about green worms. I, I really don't know what it is about insects, but if it moves, it gets attention. And if it looks like it's causing problems in your crop or if it makes a hole, well, then you really got to know what it is. And, and well, about half the time, maybe half the time, it is actually the birth armyworms that are in that picture. 
So when you talk to, about these things with a canola council agronomist, it really broadens our scope and lets us know what you're seeing in the field. And that's pretty important because we try to turn all those conversations and field visits and, and the things we might know or learn about the crop into some resources that are really pertinent for the grower on any given week. So if you're not signed up for Canola Watch, I've got a laptop off to the side, I'll happily take your postal code and sign you up. I do that at most of my meetings and I rarely get too many people uh, coming up and saying, sign me up, but it's an easy way to get you signed up because as soon as you go home, you forget. And this is one of the best resources available for relevant canola information for you every week during the summer. Now we do taper off a little bit. It's not that we're lazy, but we do have less to talk about in the winter. So it's once a month uh, in the winter. And if it's a little more in depth or we want to cover the information a little, a little uh, more, more uh, with more information than we might with these quick hitting Canola Watch articles, you'll find more of that information uh, built up into Canola Encyclopedia and some of the research material uh, covered in the Canola Research Hub. So there's a shameless plug for the resource information that we, we have available. And if you're unfamiliar with any of those, please contact any of the agronomy specialists in the room and, and talk to them about what you might have there. Now you've seen this slide before. Um, all of these discussions we have about things like Canola Watch and arguments we have about how serious a pest might be or what pest might be coming next sort of culminated in our, in our fearless leader's comment, you know, we should publish something that covers this. You know, a concise list would be really nice, and I don't know if you can ever make a concise list of potential and current threats, but, but we tried, and we've got this published in Pest Management Science. Uh, one of the speakers later is an editor for that uh, paper. I hope, I, I don't think that gave us an in, but uh, accepted for publication, no volume number yet, because it was just recently accepted. Now I want to say that I, I introduced uh, Ian Epp uh, and myself, Curtis Rempel, our, our, uh, the leader of our team uh, is also a co-author on this paper. Uh, we have at least one of the other co-authors, Justine, in the crowd. Uh, Nate Ort has moved on to, to uh, further his educational opportunities. It's no reflection on, uh, on high turnover in the agronomists that two of those names have, have moved on. It much more reflects the learning opportunity to, uh, to improve and relearn and improve again and continue to edit. And I, I have to say I hadn't published a paper before this or assisted in publishing a paper. And uh, for all you researchers in the crowd, you have my sympathies. It, it seemed like there was not a week that went by without something to follow up on a paper or try to find, try to find somewhere with the, that would actually accept it for publication. So we're very pleased to have this out. And as soon as we publish it, I'm pretty sure you also get a laugh from the cloud that, crowd that it's, it's probably out of date as soon as, we, as soon as we publish it. But it's a really nice, concise list. It uh, fits in well with the publication that we've got it put in, the, the special edition that we have it put in. So please take the opportunity to go out and look at that if, if you wish. I'm not going to go through the 11 insects, the 13 diseases, the 8 weeds that are on the list. Suffice it to say that in... in a decade of discussions, these are the kind of things that, while they might not keep us up at night, they're the kind of things that we worry about. And some of these pests are, are uh, once in a career uh, yield limiting opportunity. Some of these pests are a six fields once every five years kind of an opportunity. And some of them are any field any year. So a really wide range of, of potential threats that these, these, these problems could arise. But it is very specific to each field. So when you get called to a field, it doesn't really matter to a grower if flea beetles and sclerotinia are my number one and two problems of canola. If he has black leg, that's his concern. So we really try to focus our concerns on what we're seeing in each individual fields. The potential threats, I'm even less comfortable with putting a list of potential threats because this list should be much longer than, than it probably is. Um, I'll let, leave it up on the screen for a few moments, but. Four insects, seven diseases, three weeds. Yeah, I, I don't know if any of these are gonna keep me up at night, but they could. And surprise, we're gonna have that list wrong and we're gonna make headlines in ways that we probably don't really appreciate, particularly if you have a name like Devil's Trumpet. You know, if you want a headline like a good reporter would, you're gonna go after something with a name like Devil's Trumpet. Even if it is only a handful of fields that I, that I was aware of in, in Alberta as a seed contaminant, we did have this odd and exotic weed show up in a couple fields. I'm unaware that it became an issue or continued to be an issue, um, but it did have some interesting properties that meant we didn't want it in our canola crop. 
quarantining the first field that, uh, that where verticillium stripe, we called it verticillium wilt at that time, uh, was found, uh, probably a wise and prudent move, but continuing to look at, look at that particular uh, disease meant that we learned that it was prevalent across the prairies. And if you reach way back in the archives to 1997, I see I credited the Western producer, new pest invades Alberta, and I put a picture of cabbage seed pod weevil. I, for many of you, uh, have probably been in the industry uh, a short enough time. The cabbage seed pod weevil was in, in fields near you when you started your career and continues to be there. Verticillium stripe continues to make headlines, and it's a good example of a, of a, a disease that has been around quite a while. If you look back in the literature, uh, you could easily have had a speaker back in 1988 chatting that they just published a paper indicating that this particular disease could be an issue on Western Canadian canola, but they weren't really sure what it would amount to. So it's, it's been around a long time, not found in Canada at the time, and just not quite sure what we should have done with it. And, well, now, as we watch it march from Manitoba into Saskatchewan, and as an Alberta resident, I really haven't seen the kind of symptoms that I do see in Manitoba. Uh, it's definitely one of the big four diseases for us now. And it gives us an opportunity to talk about the way that we would like to not uh, manage a disease because we're talking about developing good, best management practices to limit the impact that this disease has at the same time as we're funding basic biology research and advising growers on variety, susceptibility or non-susceptibility before we have a, a uh, rating scale sorted out. So all good examples of things that we are going to be talking about or going to be thinking about as we worry about what's uh, around for canola. To close the presentation, uh, to make sure that I stay in time, as I mentioned, cabbage seed pod weevil, uh, found in the 1930s in British Columbia, known to be a pest on canola, not really sure what it would have for an impact at any, at any point, but in 1995, we uh, uh, started to talk about it being present in the Lethbridge area, and in the last number of years, it's a standard uh, insect of concern if you're south of the number one. Um, good example of uh, some citizen science of tracking this particular insect, you'll see Alberta Agriculture's heat map uh, watching insects. Not much of a cabbage seed pod weevil year uh, last year, the year that they, they have up here on the map. With that, I'm going to leave it open for questions. I think we had questions after this, or do we want to leave it for the panel afterwards? We'll All right, we're leaving it for the panel. And while I am at zero on the timer, I think I'm on time. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Keith. I am one of the authors in that paper, and I had to chair this session just so I could get out of presenting the paper and make Keith do it. All right, so we're going to move on to our panel here. We have a panel on the loss of insect, or insect management tools. We're going to have a couple of, of speakers. Uh, and then we're going to hold all our questions to the end. And at the end, we'll have a panel discussion, kind of like we had before lunch, where we'll have all the speakers up here. And you can ask them lots and lots of the toughest questions. Uh, our first speaker is Dr. Janet Nodal. Uh, we met on the last panel. She's going to be presenting on reduce, uh, reducing susceptibility of flea beetles insecticide seed treatments in canola. Good afternoon. I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues. Uh, I couldn't do all this work without them. Uh, Leslie Lubino and Patrick Bose. So the main objective of the study was just to find out what is going on with insecticide seed treatments and the two species of flea beetle that we have um, in North Dakota and, and same as what you have here in Canada and what impact that is having to our canola. So the, we used to do swath surveys for the canola back when we swathed the canola, and then in 2018 we ended. But you can see in the maps uh, for the crucifer flea beetle, there's some red squares which indicate some very high numbers of crucifer flea beetles in our three prime areas of canola production. And then on your right, we have the striped flea beetle. And that uh, shows you that they're present throughout the three main canola growing areas, but at a lower density. Probably the Northeast has the highest population of stripes. This is part of my PhD student, Leslie Lubinol's project. So I hope she finishes this spring. <laughs> 
So we collected the flea beetles wild in the spring as they were emerging from the overwintering site. We used Dr. Soroka's uh, boll weevil trap to attract them in. We used the Leo isocyanate to bring them into the trap and then collected them. For the striped flea beetle, we use a lure with the hydroxy ketone aggregation pheromone. We collaborated with Dr. Weber from the USDA ARS in Beltsville on this project and we set out many traps with different lure concentrations to see which one worked the best and it's published in the paper there that you see. And we did all this work in the Northeast, which is one of our key production areas for canola. And after we collected the beetles, we took them down to the NDSU campus in Fargo, where we conducted the bioassays in our new greenhouse at the time. So we use those little plastic cups that you see for growing the canola and then introducing the flea beetles into. We had six reps and we repeated the experiments all at the same time twice and the flea beetles were introduced seven days after planting. We did it two years, 2019 and 21. For our treatments, we had clothionidid Prosper FX at 406 grams AEI per 100 kilograms of seed, thiamethoxin, Helix Extra, 400, and Cyrantronilopro Lumiderm at 1,000. That's the high rate and the untreated check. And you can see the canola. We had five canola plants in each cup. And then we introduced the 10 flea beetles into the cups. Then we did live counts and feeding injury ratings at three, seven, and 10 days after infestation. And we used the same rating system for feeding injury, zero to six. And here you can see some white sand. We put the sand on top of the black soil because it just made it easier to see if the flea beetles were dead. You can see one of the dead flea beetles with its feet up there. Others are happily feeding on the plant. So here's our day three, Crucifer versus Striped. And you can see the three mode of actions or treatments on the horizontal axis and the feeding injury rating scale over on the vertical axis there. So in the striped flea beetle is orange bar and then the blue bar is the crucifer flea beetle. And then you'll see a bunch of stars above the bar that just indicates significance and the level of a significance. And NS means not significant. So you can see that the striped uh, flea beetles have much higher feeding injury and it was significant for all of the insecticide C treatments that we tested and it was, uh, they were significantly different from the untreated. It's interesting to note the Cyrantronilopro, we've observed that that's a little slower acting than the neonicotinoids and it's just due to its mode of action being a little bit uh, slower. And here's the next rating in 2021. And we observed the same trend, although the Clothiana did, we didn't see any significant difference between stripes and crucifers. The stripes still had higher feeding injury. Uh, day seven, we can see the same trend and there's also um, higher feeding now injury in the Cyrantronilopro. And there's no significant difference with, between the two untreated checks, so they were very um, happy there feeding. And same trend again in 2021. And then for day 10, uh, again, we didn't see any difference in the data. The striped flea beetles were always had more damage 
compared to the crucifer flea beetle. And the untreated was comparable to each other between the two species. And again, we had the same uh, trend. And then taking a look at mortality, we adjusted it for Abbott's, uh, using Abbott's formula. And here you can see the adjusted mortality. And here we had the crucifer flea beetle significantly higher mortality compared to the striped flea beetle. And on day three, we did see low mortality from the Siran Tranilopril, but it will catch up later. Again, we saw the same thing in the second year that we did the experiment. Uh, day seven, you can see the stripes now are starting to show a little more mortality in the Siran Tranilopril. Thymethoxin, clothianidid, getting close to 80% for the crucifer flea beetle. And there's hardly, we had hardly any mortality in the untreated. It was always less than 5%. So again, uh, comparable results. And day 10, you can see the mortality goes up and part of that's due to natural mortality. But you can see with the crucifer flea beetles were in the 90s for some of the treatments for mortality compared to the striped flea beetle, which is much lower, 60 or below. And again, the same trend. So the beauty of start is a little bit different. It's in a, another group and it's our newest insecticide, as I mentioned er, earlier, 4D uh, butanolid. So in this one is systemic. It's taken up and translocated to the codlins or seedling leaves. And you can see the red area indicates the highest concentration of the insecticide. So we tested this one in the bioassay vials um, for crucifer flea beetle and striped flea beetles. This is the crucifer flea beetle data. And we tested two different rates, a low and a high rate of Bateo start. And you can see uh, the untreated check, this is feeding injury, uh, was significantly um, high in the untreated. We evaluated at three different times, uh, three, seven, and 10 days. And you can see uh, the Bateo start had a significantly lower feeding injury for both rates and there wasn't any difference between the two uh, rates. And here, if we look at the mortality, again, it, it took, it wasn't immediate, but within uh, seven and 10 day, seven to 10 days, we saw 90% or higher mortality with both the low and the high rate. And they were significantly better than the, um, untreated, of course. And here's the data for the striped. Again, we saw significantly lower feeding injury with both rates of the Piteo start uh, from the untreated check. And the mortality was way up there in the 90s and above, which is what the growers like to see. So we also tested this in the field and this was done in 2021 at Fargo. And that particular year, we had striped flea beetles in our canola plots that were the dominant species. It was hard to find a crucifer flea beetle, but we had a lot of stripes for some reason. Uh, we tested the untreated check and then the neonicotinoid alone, uh, Prosper Everglow, and then we had the premix of Prosper Everglow and the low rate of buteo start and the high rate. Uh, you can see here for feeding injury, um, <coughs> there was significantly lower uh, feeding in the uh, seven day evaluation. However, we had so many striped flea beetles that we couldn't control them all with the seed treatment. And 11 days, as soon as we got our 10 day rating done, we went in and sprayed over the top with a foliar pyrethroid by Fenthrin. 
And you could see how low the yield is in all the treatments. That was just due to the severe pressure we were seeing that particular year. So conclusion, uh, we saw striped flea beetles had decreased mortality and increased feeding injury compared to the crucifer flea beetle. And we saw this for all three insecticides that we tested, thymethoxin, clothionidid, and sirantanilipril. And then tanzinol also found similar results for the neonicotinoid thymethoxin and clothionidid between the two species in, in Canada. So the take home message is the striped flea beetles, I believe, are slowly increasing uh, due to tolerance or resistance um, in these commercially applied insecticides. And we observed it in the two groups, the neonicotinoid and the diamines. So the new mode of action, the butanolid, looks uh, okay so far, and it does control uh, both species of flea beetle, which is good news. So why are we seeing such an increase in resistance, not only in flea beetle, but other species of insects in North Dakota, soybean aphid, red sunflower seed weevil? Uh, so this is alfalfa weevil. It just seems to be continuing to increase with other insect pests as well. And probably one of the key reasons, there's many factors, but obviously the key reason is we're continuing to use the same mode of action repeatedly for the key insect pest of certain crops year after year, or even using them several times for that insect. And sometimes we like to apply insecticides below the labeled rate just so we can save some money and make it more economical for the uh, farm over. But all of this can lead to increased selection pressure and the insects will adapt and develop resistance. So we do recommend to, we, to combat this, use an integrated pest management approach Scouting is critical and knowing your past and its biology. Getting out there and looking at your fields, it's a difficult time sometimes for growers to get out in the spring and scout their fields because they're busy planting many crops and going from crop field to crop field planting. But scouting is important. Um, we must monitor more and use thresholds so we know when the populations are economic, so we can apply foliar insecticides, but we don't wanna be applying these. We wanna protect the natural enemies out there. And then always rotate mode of action and with or set insecticide class. Unfortunately, some crops we don't have alternative modes of action. We rely primarily on our pyrethroids and we're very concerned with the insects adapting and developing resistance to our pyrethroids. Then other IPM methods, especially cultural control is easy for the farmers to do. Uh, seeding density that was mentioned earlier and planting date and no-till systems. So there is a, a good future. We're hoping to get new mode of actions and insecticides. Uh, some that we have for flea beetles now is Lumiderm fritenza, Vanticore is a foliar insecticide for um, grasshoppers primarily, Buteo start. So we're fortunate to have some of these newer modes of action and also down the road we're going to see RNAi and we're working with Syngenta crop protection on a new one that should be coming in the next two or three year in the US and in Canada. So with that, I'd like to thank all of my uh, uh, collaborators who helped us with the study and the Northern Canola Growers for funding. Thanks, Janet. Up next, we're going to have a recorded presentation from Dr. Sam Cook. 
Sam is the head of the Next Generation IPM section at Rothenstead Research in the UK. She's an invertebrate behavioral ecologist working to develop integrated pest management strategies of insect pests in arable crops, in particular oilseed rape. She's also a member of the Crop Protection Committee of the GCRC and an associate editor at the Journal of Pest Management Science. Hi everybody. My name's Sam Cook from Rothenstead Research in the UK. I'm really sorry I can't be with you all as you celebrate Canola Week, um, but I would like to tell you about cabbage stem flea beetle control in Europe, the problems we've had and some of the solutions that we've come up with following the neonicotinoid ban. I'd like to take you on a journey through space and time. We're going to fly in the TARDIS from Canada and we're going to see where we end up. And we've landed. We've landed in an oilseed rape field on Rothenstedt Farm, UK, Europe, June 2013. And you can see we're surrounded by oilseed rape fields, which is wonderful because oilseed rape is the most important oilseed grown in Europe. It's the most important break crop for farmers in the cereal rotation, and it earns them a lot of money. My team at Rothenstedt have also found that it's really good for biodiversity on the farm. My, my team have found over 213 different insect species are around this crop. However, if we'd landed the TARDIS a couple of months later and the following year, so we're talking about September 2014, we would have seen a field full of nothing. If we get out of the TARDIS and we look closely at some of the plants that we see around us, we can see that they're full of holes and they've got little black beetles crawling all over them. If we look at this plant here, we can see that it's got big holes all over the leaves. This is known as shot hole damage. If our TARDIS had landed again a couple of months later in February 2015, when the crops just made it through the winter, we would see something like this. The plants are stunted, they're black with frost damage, and the crop is looking very, very sick indeed. Again, if we look closely at some of the plants, we can see that they're full of um, little white larvae. Um, they've got holes all over them. And again, the growing tips have been damaged by frost. The culprit for all this crop damage is the cabbage stem flea beetle, Cilioides chrysocephala. So with the cabbage stem flea beetle, I like to say you get two pests for the price of one. The adult feeding threatens crop establishment because of all those holes in the leaves, makes it hard for the plant to survive, particularly through the winter, and stunts its growth. And the larval feeding inside the plant weakens it. It damages the growing point and increases the susceptibility to diseases and frost damage, as you saw in the first few slides. The adult damage was controlled really well in the past through the use of neonicotinoid seed treatments and the larvae were controlled by pyrethroid insecticidal foliar sprays. So what went wrong? What's caused all this damage and the difference between the first and the second landing in our TARDIS? Well, one of the drivers was the ban on neonicotinoid seed treatments by the EU in May 2013. This was largely due to concerns about the use of the neonicotinoids and their effects on pollinators such as honeybees. However, unusually large populations of flea beetles, because of the past couple of years, had very, very mild winters, which boosted their populations, plus the neonicotinoid seed treatment in 2013, led to farmers having a really hard time in 2014. And we actually lost around 5% of our crop nationally, which doesn't seem that much, but actually it was 70% in the east and the southeast of the country, which was massive losses for farmers in those locations. But the insecticide ban on neonicotinoids was one of the drivers. The other was pyrethroid resistance, which was confirmed in Germany in 2014, the year of the ban, and also in the UK by our own Steve Foster at Rothenstead. And you can see here from this map of England um, that some populations, particularly in the east of the country, uh, have become resistant to pyrethroid insecticide foliar sprays. So what's happened since the ban? 
Well, all seed rate cropping area has almost halved since its peak in 2012 before the neonicotinoid seed treatment ban. And since then, there's been over a 46% decrease in the area sown in the UK. This decrease in the amount of all seed rape produced in the UK has left the UK in need of rapeseed imports. We've had imports from countries such as Canada and the Ukraine, which ironically allow the use of neonicotinoids in the production. We've also had to have imports of less sustainable produced alternatives such as palm oil. Since the ban on neonicotinoid seed treatments, pyrethroids have been the only available permitted alternatives for use against cabbage stem flea beetle in all seed rape, and this has led to an increase in their use. The average has raised from 1.13 treatments per crop before the ban to 1.87 treatments per crop after the ban. And in areas of hot spots of cabbage stem flea beetles in the east and southeast, this is on average three treatments per season. It's been recorded that 202% of the all seed rape area in England was treated with insecticide sprays in autumn 2014, specifically for cabbage stem flea beetle, which represents a two and a half fold increase in the use of insecticides in England. Pyrethroid resistance in the cabbage stem flea beetle population has also increased since the ban. So you'll recognise on the left, the map of the UK, which we saw in 2014, and compare that to the one in the right, which comes from 2020, and you can see that the red areas are representing very high levels of resistance, and that's now spread across the whole of England. Um, now in 2023, we have seen populations of beetles completely resistant to pyrethroids occurring in Wales and Scotland. Without adequate controls, the numbers of cabbage stem flea beetles have increased since the ban. Here we see a graph of the number of cabbage stem flea beetle larvae per 25 plants sampled in all seed rape crops systematically since 2003. We can see since the ban in 2014, the numbers have increased substantially. In fact, they've increased around tenfold since the ban in 2013. You can see the areas of hotspot areas in the east, which is marked in red, but in the last couple of years, the numbers have increased substantially also in the north of England, which you can see in the green bars. So what's the solution to this problem? Possibly integrated pest management, which relies on the use of a combination of different practices to control a pest, not just the use of synthetic insecticides. Normally, IPM strategies are set in four different sections, set, a different, set an action threshold above which action needs to be taken, monitor the pest to make sure whether or not that population has increased or reached that threshold or not, do everything you can to prevent the problem happening in the first place, and if the thresholds have been exceeded, then use some controls. We reviewed the integrated pest management strategies that were available for cabbage stem flea beetle and found that actually we haven't got a complete strategy available to us at the moment. So what have we got? We have action thresholds. In the UK, we are advised to spray if 25% of the leaf area has been eaten by the flea beetles or if there's five larvae per plant. We tested this to see what the actual physiological response of the plant was to flea beetle damage. We manually damaged the leaves and artificially infested them with cabbage stem flea beetle larvae and then looked at the yield responses of the plants after that. Remarkably, we found that high leaf area injury, so over 90% of the leaf area loss, did not impact the productivity of all seed rape. This is not what we're seeing in the field, so we do believe that more research is needed to understand crop loss in the field. However, negative yield responses were seen when over 25 larvae, but not less than 5 larvae, were introduced. Plants were shorter, they produced less flowers and fewer pods with lower oil content than other treatments. This might suggest that the larval threshold could be too low at 5 larvae per plant, but is somewhere between 5 and 25 larvae. These numbers are damaging. 
and this research does go to show the importance of developing strategies for both the adults and the larval pests. Monitoring of adult damage is really onerous. Basically, you've got to crawl around on your hands and knees looking at tiny weeny Aussie rape plants and 25% area leaf damage is very difficult to determine subjectively. There are computerised versions that help you to assess the uh, leaf area le that's damaged and there are now automated traps that will count for you the number of, of cabbage and flea beetles that are found in traps. But monitoring, even with yellow water traps, is quite onerous and the populations of beetles change throughout the field. So we need to make it easier for farmers to monitor pests as they come into the field. So we've been looking at the potential of optical sensors for real time monitoring of Aussie brake pests and the beneficial insects. So the theory behind this is that as an insect flies through a laser beam, um, there is a disturbance which is picked up. Along with collaborators at Rothamsted, we've developed a database library of traces from known species and have used machine learning for automatic identification algorithms. We're really pleased that we've achieved around 95% accuracy in distinguishing cabbage stem flea beetle from phyllotrata flea beetles, which look very similar, at least to the human eye. The activity and abundance of insects detected by the sensor and that were assigned to cabbage stem flea beetle according to the algorithm correlated very nicely with the numbers of cabbage stem flea beetles that we caught in traps and that we observed in the field. So we've got great hopes for this technology in the future to help farmers to monitor cabbage stem flea beetle activity and immigration into the crop. Monitoring larvae in plants is particularly onerous. The plants have to be dissected and the number of larvae inside counted, which requires really good identification skills. So at Rothamsted, we've developed a larval evacuation method and we've tested it to make sure that it's robust. So plants are taken from the field and they're left to dry out naturally. The insect larvae fall from the plants and are counted from um, water trays that are placed underneath the plants. As you can see from this graph here, the number of larvae that we recovered in the water trays correlated very nicely with the number of larvae that we recovered from plant dissections. So we believe that this method of estimating the number of larvae per plant is robust. The best way to prevent pest damage in the first place is to grow pest resistant cultivars. However, none are available for any insect pest of Aussie rape. However, in our previous studies at Rothamsted, we looked at different um, brassica species and we found quite big differences between some species which were very highly attractive in the field and others which were unattractive in the field. And we tried to look at the differences that might be causing this. We're taking forward this work now with our colleagues at John Innes Centre in a project called Breeding for Resistance to Cabbage Stem Flea Beetle, where we're looking at the variation in feeding and larval survival in all seed rape cultivars and then understanding the genetic and the metabolic reasons for the differences in success of the pests. Companion planting is the cultivation of different types of plants grown in close proximity so to benefit each other. Farmers have been trying different types of companion planting methods since the neonicotinoid ban because in the absence of any alternatives, crop management is the only thing they've got. They've been trying intercropping, trap cropping and under sowing. I'm just going to focus on under sowing for this talk today. In the EcoStack project, we tested wheat, clover, oats and straw mulch treatments to try to reduce cabbage stem flea beetle feeding on all seed rape plants. And you can see from the graphs that basically all of these were, were reasonably successful in reducing the amount of feeding damage seen on the leaves in the treatments. The same treatments were also really effective in reducing the number of larvae per plant to below spray threshold levels. So these kind of um, habitat management methods really can help to reduce the problems that farmers are facing with flea beetle. 
Lastly, farmers can prevent the pest problem happening in the first place via conservation biocontrol methods. This is through use of agronomy and habitat management methods to conserve the natural enemies of crop pests in the agri-environment. Predators such as ground beetles can provide useful control of cabbage stem flea beetle. There has been the spatial association shown between the carabid Trechus quadristriatus and cabbage stem flea beetle. We've been using camera trapping to identify and quantify the main predators of cabbage stem flea beetle. We glued prey on the cards below cameras and then we looked at the photos that came from these um, to see what was actually taking the cabbage stem flea beetle larvae. Here you can see some images from these cameras and we find that the most abundant um, predators of cabbage stem flea beetle larvae are little tiny acri mites ants, carabid larvae and some carabid adults. Parasitic wasps are also important natural enemies of cabbage stem flea beetles. They attack the larval stages and Patricia Ortega Ramos in my group has also been looking at trying to identify which parasitic wasps are attacking cabbage stem flea beetle larvae and trying to look at the relationship between parasitism and the hot spots of larvae that we see across the UK. We're also really excited about Macrotonus brassicae. This is an adult parasitoid of the cabbage stem flea beetle and it was first reared um, from cultures reared at Rothamsted in 1996. However, it's been rediscovered and Patry has been finding out more about it. From using samples sent to us from farmers right the way across the UK, we found that it was present in 96% of the fields that we studied and the maximum parasitisation rate was around 36%. So it has the potential for really good control. And I actually think in the absence of any other alternative synthetic or biological control agents, this is the best hope that farmers currently have at controlling cabbage stem flea beetle. So how can farmers support the cabbage stem flea beetle natural enemy populations? Soil management is a great place to start. Both adult and larval parasitoids pupate in the soil. Therefore, minimum tillage prevents burying them too deep and can improve their survival. Uncropped habitats such as flowering field margins can provide pollen and nectar resources to help the parasitoids fuel up before they fly to the next crop. And of course, spraying when necessary helps to reduce the number of non-targets that become susceptible to pyrethroids. So we've landed again in our TARDIS. We're in the UK, June 2033. Will we see a field of oilseed rape like this, surrounded by other fields of oilseed rape? Will the UK be part of Europe again? Only time will tell. Thank you for travelling with me and thank you for listening. Our last panellist for this session is uh, Dr. Dan Johnson from the University of Lethbridge. Dan is committed to research and public understanding of science and promotion and promotion and promotes appreciation of insects, spiders, and biodiversity. He's conducted hundreds of studies in integrated sustainable crop protection, entomology, and related topics. After 20 years of research with AAFC, where he introduced the first insect GIS forecast, insecticide baits, and microbial controls, he joined the University of Lethbridge as a professor. Dan has published over 100 refereed scientific articles and supervised over 30 graduate students. Thanks very much. And uh, despite my age, I'm here in a t-shirt because I'm part of the Global Locust Initiative, uh, locusts and grasshoppers around the world. We've got a, a new big paper that covers way more than you ever wanted to know about grasshoppers and locusts coming out soon. Today, in 10 minutes, I'm going to try to give you what you need to know about the re-emerging grasshopper problem. Everybody knows the grasshopper cycle. Grasshopper cycle is, you forget about them when you're gone, and then you struggle to remember all those repressed memories when they come back. So I'll help you with that. Uh, is this the... Uh, yeah, okay. 
Okay, so uh, I won't go into the different species too much because there's enough time. Uh, but uh, Trevor Bach and a few other people have put these news items out lately in magazines and so on that really cover it well. Lots of photos if anybody ever wants to see how to tell them apart, I'm happy to send you some material and I've, I've left a few things on the, on the tables. Uh, we have a lot of species, everyone always says, gee, we have 90 species or whatever and could be anything in your field, but that's not really true because most of those species are rare or they're feeding in different vegetation. So if you've got a lot of something in your crop, it's probably one of these. And most of them eat canola. And I'll tell you a little bit about that before I get into the actual science. The one in the lower right is the only one there that won't eat canola. It doesn't have an Adam's apple. I know that sounds ridiculous, but in the wisdom of evolution, the subfamily that attacks broadleaf plants like canola has a little Adam's apple right here, a spur. So if you actually pick up a grasshopper, I hope everyone does that once in a while, tip its head back, see a spur. It's one of the canola feeding ones if it's a good sized grasshopper. The one on the lower right, very common last year and next year, and this year um, does not feed on canola. And I won't, again, I won't go into it too much, but not all grasshoppers are pests. I, I made this thing on a whim 25 years ago or something like that, and it's, I still get asked for it, so I know it's a topic of interest. There is a book online that you can easily find. You can share it, print it, whatever. Put your name on it, I don't care. Uh, 2009, a new one will come out next year with a lot more. Okay, so what do we do with grasshoppers and canola. Back in the day when we actually had research funds for this topic, we would do a lot of feeding studies in cages and we do a lot of pesticide testing and biocontrol testing. Uh, now, one of the things we found out way back then is still quoted now, I'm sorry to say, because it really should have been redone by now. We need new information. Uh, Keith Topinka, a canola expert, and Chris Weber, an economist, and myself did a cage trial back in 1990. And we found a threshold of seven to 12, but we were actually a little horrified to see that it should probably be about five whenever it's warm and dry. But I don't want anyone to be out spraying just because they have five grasshoppers or seven grasshoppers per square meter. You need to see damage, that's the bottom line. Forget the thresholds. This is not an insect that thresholds really apply to very well. Look for damage. Okay, there's the big problem, although it looks lovely sitting on that sea holly. This is the big problem in Alberta right now, the two-stripe and Saskatchewan as well. Um, two-stripe grasshopper is a gobbler of canola. It not only feeds on the pods and puts holes, but it clips them right off. That's what it looks like as an immature. And one reason people hate it is it's hard to identify. It can be green, purple, orange, yellow, tan, and so on. But if you see a green one with stripes, it's probably it. There's a few versions of it. Uh, when they're small in the spring, you can probably find them hatching at the end of May. They're tan, and then in no time at all, they're green. If you see them feeding, that's the main thing to watch for. You don't have to be a common taxonomist to detect a problem from two-striped grasshopper. At the end of the year, uh, you'll often see them. This one's particularly prone to a particular pathotype of E. gorilli, and they'll be hanging on canola plants dead, dropping spores for next year. Uh, it's very nice to see. It's interesting biology. It's good for a classroom but it's never gonna stop an outbreak. After much, much, much work in the 80s, uh, I was able to get uh, the resting spore, which is a great big 50 or 60 micron pill inside this two-stripe grasshopper to germinate and grow and kill other two-stripes. But it would only infect and kill about four or 5%. And of course, I can't get that published because everybody wants 95% all the time. We're still stuck in the chemical mindset of the 40s and 50s. Anyway, there they are hanging from plants. You'll see them. If you ever see them, you don't have to imagine it's something new because there's really only one pathotype that kills this one. Okay, that's it inside germinating, just to prove that it's been done. This is Packard's, which looks like it, but it's kind of a lighter green and peppery. It also feeds on canola. And this is the new one that's interesting. It's not new. I've been kind of following it since around 1990. Uh, Brunner's, Brunner's uh, spur throat or spur throat grasshopper, either way, occurs in foothills and in the north. It's not in the south at all, except for Cypress Hills. Um, it's dark, very dark, and it feeds on broadleaf plants. Feeds on alfalfa. Believe it or not, it prefers thistle over crops like wheat and barley, and it will feed on canola. 
Now, why does that matter? Well, with all the canola growing up in the peace regions, uh, it's an issue because that's the number one grasshopper species up there. It's 60 to 70 percent, and that's based on about 20,000 individuals that I've personally identified. This is a map of northern Alberta and the Peace regions mainly, and also Athabasca. Um, of all the sites that we had sweep samples from the fieldmen, AAAF. So I went through all those bags, almost a thousand bags. Um, that's why I don't watch much TV. And identified all the grasshoppers and then mapped the different species. All the species are mapped for all of Alberta now. The blue dots are the ones that had Brunner's spur throat grasshopper. It is very common. It has a wide range up there. Yeah, the other interesting thing about it is uh, it's hard to predict because it has a two-year life cycle. In the south, which is on the left, uh, outbreaks go up and then they go down and then they go up and then they go down every few years. On the right, in the north, they go up, down, up, down, up, down, even and odd. Really hard to tell. Okay, there's the two-stripe again, looking pretty on a flower, but it's not uh, your friend, of course. That's the two-stripe grasshopper, also very common in the north. I've heard people call it a southern species. No, it's all the way to Manning and Kig River. This is a lesser migratory grasshopper, which puts little holes in the pods. It's irrelevant in the north. Uh, there's almost none at all. But in the south, and in southern Saskatchewan, it's common. That's how to tell them apart. One is darker, and if you get a hand lens out, you can see differences. There's a few that you can see out there, like the red leg, and Dawson's with little short wings that don't matter at all. And there's the one that doesn't matter, the clear wing grasshopper. It does not have the spine on the neck, and it has blotches on the wing. If it's tan and it flies well, don't worry about it. It's not going to feed on canola. I know that's hard to remember until the next time, but that's the young one. And the very young is black and white. People phone and say, I've got black and white grasshoppers hatching in May. Right, that's the clear wing grasshopper. They're going to feed on barley and wheat. Okay, uh, people are talking about uh, uh, Sahelothrum lambda or lambda Sahelothrum, however you want to say it, depending on your nation of origin. Uh, pulled off the market. Now, why is that and what can we do about it? There's a lot of talk about it. And why it came off the market. And I still don't know why exactly, but I suspect it's over this LD50 mammalian. The acute oral LD50 mammalian um, is lower than the other pyrethroids, a lot lower, which means more toxic. The dermal's not too bad. If I recall, the dermal's around 600. But um, you can see in this uh, table here that it's 56 to 98 for the acute oral LD50, and that's low. Anything under a couple hundred is pretty toxic, and that's probably why they pulled it. So it could be just on that basis. I have not seen any other evidence. I know someone will mention biocontrol, so I thought I would just get it out there as a quick example. We've done it in, all over. I've, I've done it in Africa, Asia, uh, North America, and we do get pretty good control, but it takes some time, and it's not registered yet. So I don't have time to explain this graph. I'm very sorry. I apologize. However, the orange, Jumping from square one to two to three is Laura's band. It hammers them at first, and then they can kind of come back. Whereas the biocontrol, the red and the green, slower but lasts longer. Okay, uh, it's important to uh, consider other pests in the field. Pick things, obviously, that overlap with grasshopper control. It's important, if you can, to preserve natural enemies. And there's just one thing I want to mention, the last one. This is uh, it's bothering me for years. Uh, it says on your website, which is really excellent website, and then your publications, so at temperatures above 25 degrees, grasshoppers can't be controlled. No, that's not true. That's never been true. There's no solid evidence for that. Um, as a young, enthusiastic scientist in the 80s, I, I researched that nine ways to Sunday, and there's no such thing. It kills them at high temperature. I even have a couple of graphs I thought I'd throw in. Oh, this one's from 1990, actually. Um, yeah, so you see the way those graphs all go up to the right? That's because all of those pyrethroids kill more and more grasshoppers as the temperature rises, right up to 35. So I don't know why that's on the web. I fought in the early 90s to get it to removed. I think it's a mistake. I think it has to do with uh, experiments that were under-replicated. 
and had knockdown and recovery, which is what pyrethroids do. Knockdown, recovery. Looks like it didn't work. No, the rates were too low. Uh, okay, uh, that's the embryo of the grasshopper inside the egg. It's sitting there right now waiting for you and me. And in uh, May, um, they'll come out of that, as long as the soil temperature is above about 15 or so. We've got models, we've got rate models all fitted for the different species. We can predict when they come out. It does quite well. Uh, even degree days a little bit, but degree days, it's almost like a calendar, I guess, plus or minus a couple of weeks. I just want to mention one thing. This looks complicated, but it's not. All this is is histograms of May, June, July, August, September, and so on, all the way back to the 50s. Uh, the dark one is 2023. Everything was warm, up, up near the upper end. See those little graphs in the middle? That's 19, I, went, I, bet, I pulled, went back just for Lethbridge, but I did it for many places, but for Lethbridge, 1950 till now, took all the daily weather data instead of monthly or seasonal or yearly, which doesn't mean anything much, uh, calculated the averages for each different year for each different month. And you can see that June, July, August has these upward trends. So we might have to get used to grasshoppers because that's what they benefit from. This is a graph of 1950 to 2023, average daily weather station data uh, um, for just for the summer. And you notice that the high ones, 2021, 2022, 2023, 2017, are up there above the line. Okay, I made it exactly, well, maybe not, pretty close. So I'm done, thanks. We'll call up the rest of the panelists and we'll have, I think, just under 15 minutes for answering some questions. While we're waiting for all the panels to get up, I'll start with an easy question for Keith. Talking about future threats in canola, which is the one that keeps you up at night? There's a laundry list in that paper, but which is the one that really makes you uh, worried for, I don't know, 10 years out, 15 years out, or if it arrives here? Well, I went and looked at Swede Midge in northern Ontario a few years ago, and that, that should keep you up at night. Um, Boyd's going to cover, uh, well, actually, Swede Midge and Canola Flower Midge will be talked about later, but... If you, if you stand in a canola field in July and it's not flowering, it looks like it's got group two damage and it's from an insect, that's, that was pretty impressive. I actually can say I lost a little sleep over that one. All right, I'll open up for questions. If you have questions, I think we have people with mics running around. Clint. Are right, there some questions? Put up a, give, a, give a big wave, somebody will bring you a mic. One right. at the back here. Yeah. Thank you. So my question about Fusarium wilt, you mentioned uh, Keith, uh, Fusarium wilt as a potential disease. Do we uh, have any information about the impact of this disease in Canada on uh, canola, Fusarium wilt? I'm, I'm going to ask a question back. Did you say fusarium wilt or verticillium yep. wilt? Fusarium. fusarium. Okay, good. Just wanted to clarify that. So I am not an expert on fusarium wilt in any way, shape, or form. I did arrange a tour last year of a fusarium wilt nursery that I managed to not attend, but my coworkers tell me it was a fantastic example of uh, a single gene working to prevent damage from that, uh, that particular uh, disease. So while it is present, uh, it is a requirement of registration to, to have some genetic resistance. We're relying on a single gene to provide that and it seems to be working very well, but uh, anytime we talk about relying on a, a single gene, that should make us nervous. And uh, I'm sure that the plant breeders in the crowd could give a better answer than I could on that particular uh, disease, so. Uh, Justine, do you wanna add anything? You wrote that section of the paper? Yep. Right. Are there other questions? Hey, thanks very much, panel. Uh, Dan, this question is for you. You're talking about Matador. So the label says don't spray a Matador above 25 degrees Celsius. Um, I've sat out and watched flea beetles destroy my field because it was above 25 degrees Celsius, and they said, well, Matador is not going to work. Can you comment on that beyond just grasshoppers, but to any other insects? Is that a question for me or for someone else? Nope. I was for you. 
Okay, flea beetles, grasshoppers, they diverged about 300 million years ago. However, I'm convinced um, you can kill flea beetles in warm weather as well. I don't know where this came from, but I think it has something to do with liability and maybe not entomology. I'd like to, farmer experience is very important in this. You should be keeping notes and bringing it every year. All right, do we have other questions? Okay, yeah, Sean from online. Okay, um, <clears throat> Sam Cook mentioned that optical sensors are being used in the UK to monitor pests and beneficial insects. How widely are they being used in Canada and where are they being used? So uh, Sam's, I'm sure, was referring to some LIDAR work. And actually, um, I'm not aware that they're being used. I've been hearing about them for six or seven years. The uh, companies in Europe have been testing them. Uh, they were very accurate based on specific wing beat frequency, but uh, may maybe Janet will tell me if they've got them in North Dakota, because if they're there, then they'd probably be here soon. I, yeah, we're not using any uh, lasers or to detect insects at this point, but I know further in the south, they're using them for so arny worms and strong flying moths. To, that are going into traps and they're attracting them with pheromone lures and they're using them for detection and making management decisions. I don't know if you guys can hear me, but it's Sam here from the UK. Um, just to clarify my point that um, the sensors I talked about uh, were being, were, they're being developed in, um, in collaboration. So we're not actually using them commercially at the moment but um, they are in development. But the technology isn't so far away um, that it could be used commercially in the near future. All right, and Sam is with us, so if you have questions for Sam. Are there other questions? Yes, uh, this one would be for Sam. And it's uh, just kind of an interesting thought that I had, but uh, did banning neonics actually increase the number of pollinators in Europe? So if you get rid of half of your canola acres, I don't know, is there some relationship to that? That's a really good question. And um, yeah, the, the reason for the neonicotinoid ban was because it harmed bees. Um, Unfortunately, um, DEFRA didn't think ahead on this one and there haven't really been any very good studies on before and after the, the Nick ban um, uh, timeline. So we don't really know the answer to that question and I think as far as I can see in my own observations um, and assessments, the answer is no, there aren't any more pollinators. They continue to be in decline. Question over here. Yeah, my question is related to uh, uh, one of the threats that was maybe spoken about earlier about verticillium stripe and uh, perhaps a monitoring network or a mapping of where it might occur. This question was actually posed to me by a grower friend of mine who uh, said, you know, to create awareness, uh, he felt that, uh, you know, if there was some maps of where this is occurring, that might uh, help with the awareness. And I know. Farmers like maps, I, uh, um, we see that with club root, we, we see where the spread is, you can kind of see things, um, but I haven't been aware of anything, so I'm just wondering if that's in the works or if anybody's aware of any verticillium stripe mapping or uh, work going forward. Yeah, there, there is work happening on the verticillium as far as mapping. It was, it was kind of a part of a process of getting enough testing to make a map that's valuable, and uh, I think that is in the works. We saw disease testing happen across the Prairie Provinces this year, and. I kind of assume the results aren't out from that. I know verticillium was, is pretty widespread, so it will be a bit unlike the club bird where you have these really patches and slow growing. It is pretty widespread, but there will be some maps coming out this winter, so information to come. Paul? This question is for uh, Sam. A very interesting work um, regarding, in particular, regarding conservation biocontrol. I wanted to ask you about that. Um, what's what's uh, in the UK? How do farmers respond to that approach, and um, and where does it fit in in terms of relative importance uh, as a control measure? 
Um, how did they respond to that? Well, they, they respond to it quite well, um, really, because literally because there's no other alternatives. You know, pyrethroids don't work very well. So the only thing they've got is crop management. So And they've been trying all sorts of things. And um, so biocontrol, uh, conservation biocontrol, natural enemies are, are really starting to, you know, be a word that, that farmers can understand and they recognise that they are important. Uh, farmers are getting good at identifying caribou beetles in the fields. Um, so they are becoming much more aware of the importance of natural enemies. Um, and they want to try to um, amend their management practices to, to boost them. Um, for example, um, in the UK now we've we've got rid of a lot of our um, uh, of our financial support for farmers. Um, so we are now being basically paid paying farmers to to do certain management practices that are more sustainable. So it's sustaining sustainable farming um, initiative basically pays some farmers not to spray insecticides or pay you them to put wildflower margins next to the crops. Um, so we are, we are starting to see practices um, becoming more common that do support natural enemies. But whether they're doing a good enough job is, is still um, to, be, to be seen. You know, we're still getting a lot of crop failures. I hope that answered the question. <laughs> no, that was a great answer. Uh, another question from online. We've got a couple more here. Um, has it been determined if verticillium stripe infection and the disease severity is affected by planting dates? I don't, uh, you, you probably have the wrong panel here to answer a detailed question. So there is a lot in the verticillium front that we haven't answered, not that I'm aware of, but I would maybe find a verticillium expert before I'd. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, a second one here. Um, is there any planned research or information on efficacy of some of the newer foliar insecticides, Savanto and Exarel in canola? Was there a pest in mind with that efficacy or? Uh, not in the question, no. Take it from a flea beetle or a grasshopper perspective or anything else? Yeah, we've tested uh, quite a few different foliar insecticides, some um, including some that aren't registered for flea beetle. But we tested Xeral and it appears to work uh, fairly well. And, and I didn't have time to go through all the foliar insecticide testing, but the perethroids uh, also worked, are still working very well in North Dakota. And we didn't see any difference uh, between all the different insecticides that we tested. Uh, they all were comparable and they're pretty much all had similar yields. They weren't significant differences. And then just a comment on the perethroids and the heat. Uh, we generally don't recommend growers spray when it gets to be above 90 degrees Fahrenheit uh, because the perethroids break down more readily um, and they're not as effective. So we would you know, recommend that the growers spray uh, late in the evening or early morning when it's cooler. Any more questions? I had one for you, Janet. Uh, look th uh, looking at the difference between striped and uh, cruciferous flea beetles, you kind of mentioned like a tolerance or a resistance. Is this like a resistance like we'd see in weed science where we have like uh, enough selection pressure, we've actually seen a difference in that population or is that an innate difference right from the get-go, like a basic biology difference where this, they're just not as susceptible to the flea beetles and then that creates a selection pressure. I, th I think there's been some work up in Canada on this where they think it's mainly a physiological uh, mechanism and they become more tolerant of the insecticide. So it, no, as far as I know, no one's looked at the mechanism, whether it's genetic or to the resi causing resistance. So I guess my, my follow-up to that then is if we're looking, you know, resistance obviously, we're applying a lot of selection pressure on both of the species. Uh, in some, thinking more from a weed science perspective, sometimes rotating herbicides is okay, tank mixing is better, multiple modes of action or, or layering of different modes of action. And in, uh, maybe in the pathology world, there's sometimes where stacking them isn't necessarily best. You want to be a rotating. Is there any sense of, from a flea beetle work, whether we should be working, focusing on rotating, tank mixing, or just anything is better than what we've currently been doing? Well, that's what we were trying to get at is, you know, 
Apparently, so far, it looks like pre-mixing is working, that there's some sort of synergism between the two different active ingredients. Uh, so that seems to be working for right now. But I guess time will tell. <laughs> Unfortunately, we have the new one, retail start, and a new, it's a new mode of action, so. And hopefully we'll have some new, new ones coming in the future. I know it takes a long time to develop these insecticides. All right, last call for questions. Boyd has a question over here. Janet, with your uh, tolerance resistance monitoring, were you only monitoring from one site? Or do you have data from across North Dakota? And if you do, what, did you see any differences between the species in the different regions? Okay, we didn't take a look at the weeds for resistance. We just did the Langdon site because there's so few striped fleetles in the north central and southwest part of the state. So, and we didn't have the high populations in Fargo at that time. Okay, Can, and one follow-up. I noticed, it's, so the work you referred to in Canada by Jim Tanzi in 2008, um, they were looking at three days after, um, after three, yeah, they measured mortality after three days of feeding and probably had similar numbers to what you're seeing after 10 days. Do you have any idea what might be causing that? Just the, the delay in mortality that they didn't seem right. to get. Uh, it could be that, well, that work was done much earlier, <laughs> 2008. So it could be that the flea beetles are developing more tolerance and ours was done over 10 years later. So they could have developed higher levels of tolerance because they are con exposed to it every year in North Dakota. Just about 100% of the growers use the insecticide seed treatments. Okay, thanks. All right, I think we'll end there. We're just, we're getting, we're close to time. I wanna thank all the speakers. Maybe another round of applause for all our speakers. We have a coffee break now and we'll reconvene for the last session at three o'clock. Guess where my name Canola comes from? A plant. A seed. Is it a town? Ooh. The Canola Islands? <laughs> it actually comes from Canadian oil. It's a combination no of, yeah? Canada. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I literally didn't know that. <laughs> I didn't know that either. That's smart. Can you guess where my name Canola comes from?